It is well known that the doctrine of Wahdatul Wujud, the unity of being, attributed to the great Andalusian Sufi Ibn Arabi, is considered by most people pantheism. Is it true that Wahdatul Wujud is truly the same as pantheism? Let's find together the answer on this video. Before discussing Wahdatul Wujud, we need to take the first step to clarify what is meant by the word Wujud or being. So far, most people understand wujud, which is related to wahdatul wujud, the unity of being, as an objective reality laying around us. It actually is, but that is only half of the meaning of wujud, being. The word wujud doesn't only contain an objective meaning, but also a subjective meaning. In the objective meaning, the word wujud derives from the word wujida, which means to be found, which is usually translated into English as being or existence. Whereas in the subjective meaning, the word wujud derives from the word wajata, which means to find. In the subjective sense, it is translated into English as finding. It is important to underline that in these two meanings, there are two aspects within them. In the objective sense, being or existence has an ontological aspect, while in the subjective sense, finding has an epistemological aspect. Regarding this epistemological aspect, it should be noted that Ibn Arabi referred to those who find God, either in nature or in themselves, to be Ahlul Kashaf wal Wujud, those who uncover and discover. So, being is a subjective meaning and containing epistemological aspects can also be referred to as Shuhud, witnessing or contemplating. Then, let's move on to the issue of Wahdatul Wujud. Etymologically, Wahdatul Wujud consists of two words, Wahdat and Wujud. Wahdat means single or unity, while Wujud means being or existence. Terminologically, Wahdatul Wujud means the unity of being. But the word Wujud cannot be translated into English properly, as many Islamic scholars admit. I'll use the word Wujud without translating it. The word Wujud in the system of thoughts of Ibn Arabi is used to refer to the existence of God, Al-Haq. That the only Wujud is Wujud Al-Haq, or the Wujud of God. And there is no Wujud other than his being, which means that anything other than God has no Wujud. Adam or nothing. However, actually Ibn Arabi uses the word wujud to refer to other than God or to anything other than God. But he uses it in metaphorical sense to maintain that the existence only belongs to God. While wujud that exists in the universe as a metaphor is essentially the wujud of God lent to the universe. All the existence other than God are completely dependent on the wujud of God. Here Ibn Arabi gives an analogy of the light of the sun. According to him, the light of the sun belongs only to the sun, and that light is only lent to the inhabitants of the earth. The relationship between God and the world is often described as the relationship between light and darkness. This means that without the light of the sun, the world is total darkness. In other words, the word is nothing, Adam, because being, wujud, merely belongs to God. Thus, the meaning of wujud shows that the wujud of God is the only wujud. There is no existence but his existence. Simply, this means that anything other than God has no wujud. Logically, it can be concluded that wujud cannot be given to anything other than God, Masiwabwa. In a simple statement, all of our existence are the existence of God. Here we need to be careful and we shouldn't ask, does it mean we are God? We will answer that. The central theme of Wahdatul Wujud is about the unity of God with the universe, or in other words, God encompasses all. Thus, the notion of Wahdatul Wujud means the doctrine that equates God with the universe or equates the universe with God. Roughly speaking, this understanding admits that there is no difference between God and creatures. If there is, then it is only on the belief that God is a totality, while creatures are part of that totality, and God appears in everything in the universe. Everything is his appearance, there is nothing in this world but God. If this is the case, here we can conclude hastily that Wahdatul Wujud is the same as pantheism. That's the answer if we conclude hastily and simplify this complicated issue. In other words, it is as simple as that, but Wahdatul Wujud is not that simple. Although Ibn Arabi understands Wujud as a single being attributed to God, Ibn Arabi doesn't fully comprehend reality in a monorealistic sense. He uses the term Al-Haq which refers to God and Al-Khalq which refers to creatures or anything other than Al-Haq. 
as we have understood earlier that the only existence belongs to al haq then the question is what is the ontological position of al haq creatures is the word completely identical with al haq or does the word surely have no wujud at all Ibn Arabi answers this question simply but very ambiguously. This word is al haq and not al haq. Huwa la huwa, he and not he. This means that this word is al haq, but at the same time this word is not al haq. Ibn Arabi expounds the cosmos stands between nature and al haq and between wujud and non-existence. It is neither pure wujud nor pure non-existence. Hence, the cosmos is all sorcery, and you are made to imagine that it is al haq, but it is not al haq. And you are made to imagine that it is al khulq, but it is not al khulq. For the cosmos is not creation in every respect, nor is it al haq in every respect. Hence, it is known for certain that were creation to be disengaged from al haq, it would not be, and were it identical to al haq, it would not be creation. Ibn Arabi frequently quotes a verse in the Quran to show the ambiguity of wujud. And you threw not, O Muhammad, when you threw, but it was God who threw. This verse affirms the individual reality of the Prophet Muhammad, then later refuses it by saying that God is actually the only reality behind these apparent events. Ibn Arabi said nature is his deeds because it becomes visible with the attributes of al haq If you say something about the cosmos, it is al haq You have said the truth because God said and it was God who threw. If you say something about it is al haq You have said the truth because he said when you threw. Because he is disclosed and closed, affirming and negating. So it is him and not him. He is the known and the unknown. The ambiguity of this explanation is acknowledged by Ibn Arabi himself. But a clear formula on this issue is very difficult. Verbal expression, Ibarra, is not sufficient and conceptualization, Tasawur, cannot define it. For it is lost quickly and its properties contradict one another. It is like his saying, you did not throw. Thus he disclaims, when you threw. He thus affirms, but it was God who threw, thereby denying the existence of Muhammad again and asserting himself as identical with Muhammad. Another sentence of Ibn Arabi which has the same meaning is, There is no question more ambiguous or more difficult or more mysterious than this issue. Therefore, it is not surprising that many people misunderstand Ibn Arabi's mysticism and accuse him of having equated God with creatures. Yet here we see that in fact Ibn Arabi never really asserted that this word is holy al haq or God. Then, can Wahdatul Wujud still be understood to be pantheism? Before deciding whether Wahdatul Wujud is the same as pantheism, now we need to briefly investigate what pantheism is. I know that most of us have known what pantheism is, that in short, all entities are God. That is indeed the most popular understanding of pantheism. But let's try to make it a little more detailed. A definition put forward by Thyssen, Pantheism is that theory which regards God as one with the natural universe. God is all, all is God. Another definition of pantheism was proposed by Ockhart. He said the fundamental formula of pantheism would seem to be a double one. Nothing is which is not God, and God is everything which is. God and the universe must be identified. And if any part of the universe cannot be identified with him, that part must be negated. Newton defines pantheism more clearly. Pantheism from pan, all, and theos, God, is a view of reality that tends to identify the word with God or God with the word. It generally emphasizes the immanence of God in the word and de emphasizes or ignores his transcendence over the word. The last definition important enough to put forward is written by Geisler and Watkins. In pantheism, God is all in all. God pervades all things, contains all things, subsumes all things, and is found within all things. Nothing exists apart from God. From the several definitions that we have proposed, we can highlight several significant points of pantheism. That pantheism emphasizes the immanence of God and ignores the transcendence of God. And that God and the Word are identical with each other. And that's all is God. 
Of course, from those definitions, we cannot at all accept that Wahdatul Wujud is the same as pantheism because Ibn Arabi still truly emphasizes the negativity of God or the transcendence of God over the cosmos. Interestingly, there is one definition of pantheism unlike the previous one. This definition was proposed by British philosopher Walter Terence Stace. He wrote, according to the definition which I propose, pantheism is the philosophy which asserts together both of the two following propositions. Namely, first, the word is identical with God. Second, the word is distinct from, that is to say, not identical with God. Stace's definition seems paradoxical. If this pantheistic paradox means that God is identical with and different from the word, of course it also means that God is immanent in the word and transcendence over the word. In line with our conclusion, Stace also said that just as mysticism leads to the paradox that God is both identical with and distinct from the word, so also it leads to the paradox that he is both personal and impersonal. Now we can consider Stace's understanding of pantheism is in line with what was meant by Ibn Arabi. Stace's definition is a definition that conspicuously differs from other definitions. In addition, it seems unpopular and has not been published widely. In other words, Stace's definition is unknown to many. Perhaps most of us just knew such an unfamiliar definition of pantheism. It's also possible that scholars don't agree with these definitions because it deviates from the commonly known definitions, with the result that Stasis definition is not familiar to us. Now let's answer our main question, is Ibn Arabi's Wahdatul Wujud pantheism? The answer totally depends on which definitions of pantheism we refer to. If we refer to pantheism which understands the immanence of God in the word, or that the word is fully God, then pantheism is exceedingly different from Wahdatul Wujud because Wahdatul Wujud doesn't view God as immanence fully. But if we refer to the definition of pantheism proposed by Stas, that pantheism emphasizes the immanence and transcendence of God at once, then Wahdatul Wujud can be categorized as pantheism because Wahdatul Wujud itself emphasizes these two sides, immanence and transcendence. I personally tend to avoid using the term pantheism to label Wahdatul Wujud because Stace's definition of pantheism that accords with Wahdatul Wujud is unpopular, while the popular definitions of pantheism do not accord with Wahdatul Wujud. Therefore, labeling Wahdatul Wujud as pantheism can lead to big misunderstanding. What do you think about it? Do you comprehend Wahdatul Wujud to be the same as pantheism in the popular sense? Or you try to comprehend Wahdatul Wujud in Stasis definition, then keep labeling it pantheism? I really wonder your opinion. Please put it on the comments below. See you there.